So now, welcome here to this special edition or qu a special report of Racing Hotspot. Um, we are going to quickly bring in Mr. Larry McReynolds, Fox Sports Analyst. Uh, first of all, thank you, Larry, for taking time out of your busy schedule to talk to us. No, it, it's, uh, it's my pleasure. I, I hate to uh, send me with you up there in Loudoun, New Hampshire, this go around, but the way the new TV package is structured this year, uh, to start the 10-year deal with being split between the two networks, Fox Sports and NBC Sports, unlike in the past, uh, where we would still be there doing maybe a practice show or a qualifying show, uh, the way the new package is structured, Fox has everything on track from Daytona through Sonoma the end of June, and NBC has everything on track from Daytona in July to Homestead in November. So, first time, uh, I, I gotta believe it's the first time I've not been to, to New Hampshire for a race uh, since they first started bringing the Spring Cup Series there back in 1993. Wow, that's a that's a bittersweet, I guess. <laughs> Um, it, it, it is. I love going to the track, but it is it is kind of nice driving back the schedule just a little bit. You know, it's not like though I'm sitting on the lake fishing or in the woods hunting or anything like that. They still keep you awfully busy doing studio shows. We still do race hub uh, on either Fox Sports One or Fox Sports Two every evening, Monday through Thursday at 6 p.m. Eastern. And then whatever day the race is on, like this weekend at Loudon. We're in the studio doing the race day pre-race show and then the victory lane post-race show on Fox Sports 1. So they still keep us busy, just not, not near the travel that we do in the first half. Well, I always look forward to race day and victory lane. Of course, I'll watch it afterwards this weekend because I'll be at the track. But um, you guys always put on a great show over at Fox. Um, so let's get right into things, of course. Uh, we're just going to quickly talk about speedway safety. Um, we've seen safety come a long way in the past or last 12 or 13 years, but uh, we've seen a huge push for improvement the last couple months, and that's because of Kyle Busch's accident at Daytona. Um, after Daytona in February, how do you feel safety has improved or developed at the racetracks? Yeah, I kind of I kind of hate it when it takes something kind of bad to happen before we react. I I wish we could be more of a of a proactive sport than we than we are as a reactive sport. But yeah, even though since the death of Dale Earnhardt Sr. in the Daytona 500 in 2001, safety has grown in light years. You know, and it and it's a full package. It's not just one thing that makes it safer for our drivers. Now, the one thing that I do say is we will never, ever, ever make our sport 100% risk-free. And you know what? We probably shouldn't. I mean, we don't want to see anyone get hurt. Certainly don't want to see anyone get killed. But one of the attractions of our sport is it's a sport that's fast, and it's a sport that's dangerous. And, and I think if we ever completely... Uh, you know, accomplish those two things about our sport, it will it will lose some of its flair. But yeah, when I look at where we're at today versus before the accident with Dale Earnhardt in 2001, when you look at the construction of the cars, when you look at seat technology, full face helmet, head and neck restraint devices, uh, the, again, the way the cars are being constructed uh, with the energy absorbent foam in those doors, and then, of course, the racetracks with the safer barriers that's been installed in so many areas. But I will say, we probably got a little bit relaxed, and we probably let our guard down a little bit, because it had been quite a while since anyone was, was hurt or injured. And, of course, we got the wake-up call again uh, in a different way with Kyle Busch in the Xfinity Series race at Daytona. But what I do like is... Every racetrack we go to, all 23 tracks, that since that accident in February, that we have had a ton more of safer barrier installed at, at all the different racetracks in places where it was it was too, too short of a notice, not enough time, or the configuration of the wall, or whatever, 
where they couldn't put safer bear, they were putting tire packs. Now that's not the that's not the ultimate. I still think it should be on our radar that at some point there's a line in the sand that says everywhere we race, every wall inside and outside should have safer barrier. I think that's that's where we need to get. But I but I look where we come in the five months since his accident at Daytona. Uh, there's a lot of money been spent, a lot of effort in improving the walls uh, around different racetracks, especially they come in Talladega. The other thing that, that I'm seeing is more and more tracks are getting rid of the grass. I'm a firm believer there shouldn't be a blade of grass nowhere near a racetrack because when you get on grass, especially if the grass happens to be wet, from a, a rain earlier in the week, you might as well be on ice. Where when you're on asphalt, it scrubs speed off. And I look at what Daytona did. Not only did they install the safer barrier in the area that Kyle Busch wrecked in February, but they also got rid of all that grass and paved all that area. All right. Well, w oh, sorry. Are you? Do you have more to say? I know NASCAR, the teams, the manufacturers, the tracks, we, we never quit looking at it because every time we think a car has landed somewhere or hit a wall somewhere that we've never seen before, we, we always think, you know what, that car can't hit there. But just lo and behold, that will be the very place the car hits. Jeff Gordon has been the poster child for the last number of years in finding walls that don't have safer barrier. But, you know, I speak, I, whenever I talk about our sport, especially I think when it comes to safety, I can, I can wear the hat of a guy that's been in the sport for 35 years. I can wear the hat of a guy that worked on cars for 20-something years. I can wear the hat of a now a broadcaster for 15 years. But remember this, I can also wear the hat of a dad that has a son that races, that has raced at Daytona and has raced at Talladega. And we do know that it is a risky sport. To my point earlier, it's one of the things that makes it attractive uh, is the fact that, that it's fast, it's a fast sport, and it's a dangerous sport. Yeah, and I, I cannot agree with what you said any uh I can't agree anymore um and I would have to uh just quickly point out up at here in Loudon they put uh they took away the grass on the back straight away and they put safer barrier along that back stretch wall from turn 2 to about the uh, I'd probably say 2 or 300 feet from turn 3 so uh NHMS is definitely taking that into uh effect and put in safer barrier well, and, and then in the tracks defense, you know, and I, I probably was one of the ones that was more vocal after Kyle's accident that what are we doing? We're, we're 15 years into this project and we still have walls without safe barriers. That's, that's, that's not acceptable. But I will say safe barrier is a very expensive thing to do, which honestly should not be an excuse. Uh, it, it, in some cases, the walls have to be completely replaced because, you know, there's only certain walls that, that will accept safer barrier. And, and then also, we have to remember every racetrack we go to, for the most part, has to accommodate different series. Sometimes the road course in the infield, so that can become a bit of a challenge, trying to put safer barrier all the way around the racetrack, inside and out. Yep, and like I said, couldn't agree with you more. Um, so, moving on to our next question, you answered my follow-up questions. You must have read my mind. Um, <laughs> moving on to the next question here. After two consecutive weeks of cars, or now trucks, going into the catch fence, so once a Daytona with Austin Dillon, which was a horrific accident, and I am really glad, and I assume you're going to be really glad too, that he walked away from that. Um, and then the second one, just this last week in Kentucky, with Ben Kennedy just 
barely basically clipping the fence, but it was enough to end the race early. Um, do you think there are any possible improvements to shore up the fences, if any, or do you think the fences are the best they can be and those were just racing type accidents? And neither is NASCAR and say that was just one of those racing deals. Uh, we have to learn from things. But the one thing I will say, in the case of Austin Dillon at Daytona, which, yeah, was a probably one of the most horrific crashes I have seen in a long, long time. And then, of course, Ben Kennedy this past Friday evening, uh, or Thursday evening in Kentucky, uh, the, the car and the truck did its job in protecting the driver, and the fence, for the most part, did its job in protecting our fans. But but I think in the case of, of both of those situations, NASCAR, especially the three car, they are going through those race vehicles stem to stern, bumper to bumper, roof to full pin, and seeing, even though Austin and Ben walked away, especially Austin, that is there anything else we can make better with this race car? Is there anything we're missing? And that's the reason that car is still over to NASCAR and Diesel. On the flip side, with the catch fence, they're not just going to repair that catch fence at, at Daytona. I'm sure NASCAR, the tracks, everyone involved are going to take a look at that catch fence as well as the catch fence in Kentucky, even though they had to repair it pretty quickly because cars were on track the next day, and saying, is there anything that can be a little bit better about our catch fence? If indeed there can be, and I'm not going to say there is, or there, if there, there can or there can't be, I don't know. The two things that I think we have to look at, and I think we got that little bit of wake-up couple, even though Fitz did his job and the car did his job, I continue to see a lot of engines and transmissions as a full unit come detached from the race car. And I'd be willing to bet this is something that NASCAR is looking at. Do we need to have the engine and transmission tethered to the main structure of the race car where it can't just get out there and pretty much go wherever it can? wherever it lands. I think that's something we have to look at. I go back to the wreck with Kyle Larson at Daytona uh, year before last. Uh, remember, his whole engine and transmission went on the other side to catch them. So I think that's one thing we have to be thinking about. And then I don't know what else to be done with the catch fence, but I think we do have to, what we do have to evaluate is some of our tracks. Do we have our fans sitting too close to the catch fence. I like what Kentucky Speedway has. Those fans are back a little bit, and they're actually elevated a little bit. The first row is, is, is about 10 or 12 feet up in the air off the ground. So I think that's something, and I think they told it, even though their backs are against the wall trying to finish it, they told a rising project, they have a golden opportunity to evaluate do we have our first few rows of seats too close to the catch fence? But, you know, there definitely has been a lot of improvements made with catch fences. When Carl Edwards got up in the fence at Talladega in the spring race of 2009, all the catch fences were looked at and a lot of stuff was redone, especially at they call in Talladega. But honestly, at all race tracks. Uh, Dover just installed a brand new catch fence all the way around that racetrack that we saw for the first time. And then when Kyle Larson's situation happened uh, at Daytona a couple of years ago, uh, they completely redid all of the all of the gate in catch fences. So we've come a long way with that. But uh, again, I don't think we can just say. The cars, the trucks are exactly where they need to be. The fences are as good as they can be. But in both those wrecks, ironically, back-to-back -back weeks, all of the stuff did their job for the driver and for the fan. All right. That, um, I'll go say you'll probably think I'm uh, recording now, but I can't agree with you anymore. Um, 
basic uh dang it I had a I had a follow up question. Sorry. <laughs> um base, the Ben Kennedy accident, um, would you agree with me in when I say that the Ben Kennedy accident is the type of accident that can happen at all tracks, basically? That That can happen where now, sorry. Um, that can happen at any track, whether it's a super speedway or it's a short track. Would you agree that that would that type of accident could happen anywhere? Yeah, I, absolutely. And, and quite honestly, the red, black, Austin villains, it, it could happen at any of the fast race tracks. It could happen at Texas. It could happen at Atlanta. It could happen at Indianapolis. And that's <clears throat> that's what I said. <clears throat> excuse me. After the wreck at Daytona, which after what happened in Kentucky kind of supported what I was feeling, I'm not sure we need to mess with the product on the racetrack. You know, I've, I've heard people say we need to slow them down, we need to do this, we need to do this. I'm not sure we need to mess with the product on the racetrack. We just need to make sure that everything about these cars are as safe as they can be and everything about these catch fences are as good as they can be. Uh, and because there are really not a lot of comparison between those two accidents. One was with a car, one was with a truck. One was at a two and a half mile track, one was at a mile and a half track. And then the speed difference between those two were substantially different. You know, Austin Dillon was running well over 190 when he wrecked, and I'd say Ben was maybe 150, 160, you know, 20, 30 miles per hour slower. All right. Um, and the, my line of thinking behind that the Ben Kennedy accident can happen at any track is you just basically need to get the front or the back end of the car above that wall to get to the fence. Um, the example I was using was a couple of years ago we saw Casey Kane, I believe at New Hampshire Motor Speedway in the Xfinity series, he got two wheels on the wall and he rode the wall around. Um, so basically, you would just need to get the car above the wall to have a Ben Kennedy type accident. Whereas the Austin Dillon one, you need to have a fast track to get him that high in the air. Yeah, you know, like I say, there, there's never, there's never two accidents the same, and there's never an absolute formula for how two wrecks are similar. You know, they're, they're never the same. Everything's always a little bit different. But to your point, every time we think we've seen every type of accident that can happen, we've seen a car hit every place on a racetrack it can hit, all of a sudden when we feel that way, we see something we've never seen before break out. And I think that's currently what NASCAR and the tracks um, are continuing to look at. All right. Well, we'll keep this interview rather short, so we'll get to our last question. Um... The last question I had was, for any fans that might be going to an upcoming NASCAR race, so like, uh, for example, I'll be going to New Hampshire Motor Speedway this weekend, um, or any motorsports event similar to NASCAR that has like a catch fence or like IndyCar or Formula One, uh, completely different from NASCAR, but what would you say to them if they were concerned about their safety as a fan in the grandstands? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't sit here and tell you that as a race fan, if you go to a racetrack, uh, if you sit in those grandstands, that there's going to be a risk. And I think it's a very small percentage of risk, but there, there is a risk. But you know what? If you go to a, a hockey game, you run the risk of getting hit with a, with a hockey puck. If you go to a baseball game, you run the risk of getting hit with a foul ball or a broken bat. We saw a lady earlier in the year, I don't remember where, she got hit in the head with a broken bat. I watched something on Fox Sports Live yesterday morning at a baseball game where a dad was not watching the game. He was talking to somebody, and fortunately his son, sitting beside him, had a baseball glove on with hopes of catching a foul ball. And had his son not been sitting there and watching what was going on, the dad would have got beamed 
in the side of the head with a foul ball, but the little boy stuck his glove up and caught it. So you go watch a sporting event almost of any kind, there there is a risk. There, there there's a risk driving your your passenger car down the highway. But probably what I would tell anybody, if you are concerned, sit as high as possible. But I think the biggest thing, and I, and I use the case, the example of the guy at the baseball game, never turn your back on the game. Never turn your back on the racetrack. Now, that still doesn't make it bulletproof, but you, you need to always be looking at what's going on. It's what I used to tell my guys on pit road. Never, ever turn your back to the racetrack because you never know what might be going on out there. But for the most part, 99.99%, you are, you are safe sitting in those grandstands. But, but there's always that, that 0.11% that something could truly happen. All right. And I had read on the back of our tickets... Um, and I'm pretty sure it's with any sporting event, and especially with NASCAR, on the back of the tickets it says you are, um, I guess, subject to possible injury. I don't. I think they said that wrong, but uh, on the back it basically does say you are. There's a possibility that you could get injured, and I guess that's for track liability. Yeah, I'm sure it is, but I'd be willing to bet that same that same thing is written on a baseball ticket or a hockey ticket or any sport where you go to where there could be, you know, a risk. I mean, I go back to, to Pocono when those fans got struck by lightning. You know, it's, uh, we try to make things as safe as we can for everything and everybody, but unfortunately, unless you just live in a bubble or never leave your house, uh, I promise you there's a lot less risk sitting in those grandstands on Sunday at Loudoun then there probably is in your car driving to and from the racetrack. All right. Well, um, any other things you would like to say on this topic before we conclude the interview? You know, I, I've been in the sport of NASCAR for, for 35 years, and and I love this sport. It's, it's all I've ever done. And, you know, I know it gets beat, it gets beat up a lot about different things. It gets beat up about the competition. It gets beat up about the safety. It, it just, it's like it's a never-ending people piling on our sport. But I do know this, that contrary to other motorsports, we have the most competitive motorsports that's out there. We have had 18 races, and we have had 11 different winners, and we still have a half a season to go. And if I look back at that final race of the year at hit Homestead last year, how could you ever ask for anything better for four drivers and four teams coming down to the final lap of who's going to win the championship, that you're going to have to win the race to win the championship? And, yeah, we'd like to make it risk-free for our drivers, risk-free for our fans. That's our goal, and that will always be the goal. That will be the goal long after I'm completely gone from the sport. But you're just, you're never going to get there. But I'm not sure we should get there because, as I said, it's one of the attractions of the sport. It's fast and it's dangerous. And I know people continue to want to beat up the sport about TV ratings and, and uh, attendance, but... Look at that crowd at Loud. Yeah, there'll probably be some empty seats, but there's still going to probably be eighty or 90,000 people there. That's more people than attended the Super Bowl in Arizona last February. So how can you say attendance is down? And the same with the TV ratings. We are by a long shot, second only to the NFL. So I, I know people want to beat the sport down, but... You also, I think, have to look at the glass like it's pretty darn half full and not half empty. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, like I said at the beginning of the interview, thank you so much for doing this with us and um, taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, basically inter be interviewed by an amateur uh, <laughs> sports broadcaster over here. 
no problem. Glad, glad we could do it, and, and hope we gave you some good insight. Oh, you definitely did. So um, that's going to do it for this special report. Um, so, yeah, uh, until we see each other this weekend for all of our live cover or filmed live coverage at New Hampshire Motor Speedway, have a good rest of your week, everyone. Goodbye. Just hold on one second.